The following programme is made possible by the friends and partners of Creation Today. Welcome to the Creation Today show, where we bring together interviews with experts and solid Bible teaching. Your host, Eric Hovind, affirms the ultimate authority of God's Word, the truth of creation, and why it matters to you. Well, welcome to the Creation Today Show, guys. I'm your host, Eric Hovind. When you say to someone, I love you to death, or if you're under 30 and you text L-Y-T-D to somebody, the shorthand for love, shorthand for love you to death, those words, those, those letters, they're, they're trying to communicate the depth of your love for an individual. You love them so much that you would go to the point of death for them. I don't know if you realize this, this saying actually comes from the writings of John in the New Testament. He was one of Jesus's 12 disciples. And in John chapter 15, he actually records a powerful teaching from Jesus. And Jesus says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. He then says, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I love you to death. My question for you today, if God has told us what will happen to individuals when they die without Christ, without being born again, if it's, if it's clear in Scripture that there is a real heaven and a real hell, and that individuals without Christ will end up in that real hell, how loving are you? when you do not tell them about that reality? How loving are you if you don't give them the good news of how they can be born again? You wouldn't be loving people to death, would you? No, I believe you'd be loving people. You'd be loving them to hell. Today's guest uh, might be short in stature, but he is mighty in wisdom. Let me tell you, he is the best-selling author of more than 100 books. I got a lot of his stuff sitting here with me. Actually, I mean, some of them are more like pamphlets than books, uh, you know, but whatever. I mean, and then there was that one that he did that was basically a reprint on the origin of species with an extra chapter at the beginning. I don't even know if that one counts, but regardless, uh, I hope you can understand him. He's got a thick Australian accent and I love him to death. If he knows how to turn on his camera, he's going to join me right now. My friend, Ray Comfort. Or maybe with that introduction, he's just not going to do the show with me. Maybe that's what's going to happen, Ray. No, I'm stacking up books to try and reach the camera here. I'm standing <laughs> on it. Like, you uh, got to turn my video on or do I turn it on? You turn you, it off. You've got to turn it on. Here, I'll ask I you to start. clicked on it and says unable to go on. There we go. Is that better? You're on yeah, now, buddy. Oh. Hey. How are you, I sir? I got to apologize for being late to the Zoom. I didn't get to tell you why it was a, a genuine problem I had. I was fixing the chicken coop and it was more important than getting on this program early. And I do apologize. No, no. Hey, you know what? I told you I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> fixing the chicken coop. And that's a re that's the real story. That's the real story. I was in uh, the chicken coop. Well, I am really glad you're joining me today. I don't know if you remember uh, I had your daughter on the show a few months ago for Mother's Day, and wow, uh, she, without a doubt, and I've had you several times, she is the best guest I've ever had on this show, ever. She's incredible. Are you <laughs> proud of that girl or what? Well, I tell you what, you won't get an ounce of jealousy in my heart because of you saying that. I am just so thrilled. It was she incredible, is. man. She talked to moms and was such an encouragement. I just, I thought it was so, so good. So, well, I, I got to tell you, she's my favorite daughter. I'd easily give her a coat of many colors if I could. She's absolutely wonderful. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, and I have one I, daughter, by the way. Yes, I, I, well, I guess people probably, maybe they didn't know that. I, yeah, I, I thought I'd better qualify it. Hey, Ray, you did a blog uh, a little while ago, and it made me want to have a conversation that's titled How to Love Someone to Hell. Um, it's, it's something that I, I wonder if Christians even wrestle with this. And in your blog, you started off, you said all Christians should make sure 
to warn unbelievers about hell, you know, when they're sharing the gospel, do not avoid this. To do so, you said, would be morally wrong. And I'm kind of wondering, what kind of reactions have you gotten to that concept, to, to talking about hell? So that's what I want to talk about in the show. But before we get there, I want to do a little walk down memory lane with you, Ray. Can we walk down memory lane here real quick? Do you remember... Several years ago, I uh, was there in Southern California and you said, hey, why don't you join me for a show? You were doing a show titled On the Box and I joined you for an On the Box episode. Do you remember that? Something about water, was it? No, well, I got the clip. Kent's got the clip for us. Thought he'd just show us kind of what happened on the show as we walk down memory lane. Kent, take us down memory lane. I don't, I really shy away from any kind of embarrassing situations. I hate so are you saying you don't want me to share that story? Because I won't, out of respect for you, I won't share it. No, don't, don't. It would embarrass him. I All would right, be fine. embarrassed if you right. share that about. Okay, well, well, the boss. Ah! Oh my goodness! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I was actually hoping to get your face. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'd be mourned. I'd be mourned. Oh, so, man. for those of you who didn't see that, we lowered the spider on. He knew the spider was going to be lowered. And you you're playing like every show in the show now. Come on. So, we put this like, here so like, that you'd think water was chucked on you. Anyway, welcome to the program. So that wasn't water, it was just bits of paper, is that right? That was bits of paper. Ray, Mark Spence was my best friend, or at least I thought so, up until that point. Oh man, if you if you missed that, it was an on-the-box episode, and they were doing this thing where they were scaring their guests with a fake spider, lowering it down. I had seen the show, so I knew Ray was going to do it, and I said, hey Mark, I got an idea. When Ray does that to me, I'm going to like get so scared that I that I like hit him. And, and Mark, he went and told you, didn't he? Well, I'm his boss. He wants to keep his job. <laughs> he didn't have to tell you that he knew, man. I was like, hey, just making sure this is OK. So you guys decide to play it back on me. And I watched my face as I rewatched that. And I went, you really got me again because I was like, oh, I'm going to get him good. And then lo and behold, I'm the one who ends up getting scared on that again. Ah, you're such a jokester, and you have you have you just haven't grown up yet, have you, buddy? <laughs> That's a two-edged sword. Just stop. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, hey, if you guys are joining me on Facebook uh, or on uh, on YouTube on our live, I want to thank you guys for joining the Creation Today Show. To all my partners hanging out with me, thank you guys so much. We're going to have a great conversation. Uh, this uh, that can be difficult, but I think at the end of the day, we're going to find out it's going to be incredibly loving to actually uh, have the conversations that we're going to ask you to have with others. I've got a little giveaway I want to do. I have loved for years, Ray your evidence study Bible that you spent a lot of time and energy investing into. Oh, you mean that pamphlet? Yeah, the little pamphlet. <laughs> the little, this this one is definitely worthy of authorship right here, okay? This is a lot of work. Uh, your Evidence Study Bible is incredible, so we want to give this away to one of our partners. So, hey, partners, if you're on here and you want to grab a copy of Ray Comfort's Evidence Bible and ship to you, Ray, I don't know if you know this, you guys are actually sponsoring this one. This is being sent out by you, paid for by you, so you're the one doing this. I didn't ask you, but I asked somebody that uh, works for you, and they said, yeah, you'd be happy to pay for it. So, hey, partners, just comment, what's your favorite book of the Bible? I don't care what it is, just put a comment in there, and as soon as you put a comment in there, you are registered to win the copy of the Evidence Bible sent to you by Ray Com Ray, would you sign it for him? Yeah, if I get reminded to. Okay, I'll, we'll remind you to do that. We'll remind you. Oh, that's awesome. All right, Jim and Mary are already jumping in there. Genesis. Uh, oh, got, got Colossians, Job. Whichever one I'm currently reading is your favorite book of the Bible. I'm kind of a Romans guy. I love Romans, Colossians. All right, ladies in the office are going to pick that out here in just a few minutes. Um, Ray, as we start the show, I, I did a poll on Instagram. And I, I had this up and I wanted to find out when was the last time the, the, the people that follow our Instagram shared the gospel. And 60% uh, answered as often as I can. 40% said maybe once a year. Now, when we looked at the numbers, Ray, of how many people answered that poll versus how many answered the next poll 
the numbers were not equal. So very few people answered this poll compared to the next poll, which makes me think they were trying to hide something, okay? The, the second question we asked was, uh, do you think it's necessary to tell people about hell? And 100% of people said, yes, of course you got to tell people about hell. How else are they going to know uh, about their need for salvation? But we had a lot of people answer that and very few answered the one before. It sounds like very few people actually share their faith. First of all, I'll let you just beat up on my audience on that one real quick. Go ahead. What do you think about that? I think one of the, the greatest reproaches on human nature is the Great Commission. Mark 16, verse 15, where Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The fact that he had to tell us, command us to tell people they can find everlasting life through repentance and faith in Jesus shows the wickedness and selfishness of the human heart. It's like finding a cure to cancer and sitting in your your laboratory with that cure in front of you and someone comes to you and says, go and give it to the patients that need it. Man, if a doctor's a good doctor, he'll run out that door screaming, I found it, I found it, I found a cure to cancer. And so I, I, I uh, when I became a Christian, I didn't have to get told to share the gospel. I just wanted to, and that's the miracle of the new birth. God says, I'll take my law and write it upon your heart and cause you to walk in my statutes. I think the Living Bible says God will cause us to do the things he wants us to do without him even telling us to. And so if you've got the love of God within you, if you naturally love your neighbor as yourself, you'll be as concerned for his salvation or her salvation as much as you're concerned for your own. And I've got to, I got to tell you, I am horrified daily by the thought of death and the thought of hell puts my horror on steroids. To think that God is a God of justice and truth and holiness, I was just thinking this morning, how incredibly um, crazy we are to demean the nature of sin. You ask anyone, how many lies have you told in your life? They say, oh, I've told a few, but they're just little lies. They're white lies. They're a certain color because they're not important. They're just white. And we tend to trivialize sin. But if you want to see how God see sin look at what happened in genesis one sin opened the door to death and damnation and pain and suffering and all the disease and all everything we see on this earth that, that brings with it pain and terror comes because of that one transgression god killed a man in genesis 38 because he didn't like what he did sexually he killed a husband and wife in uh X because they told one lie and they're just little glimpses where God just let his holiness spill over from heaven onto the earth. And so each of us should be horrified that the thought with the thought that we're going to have to face God on judgment day. Eric, I think our big problem is idolatry in this nation and throughout the whole world where people have a wrong understanding of God's nature and character, have this image of God that's erroneous. For example, when you look at the sun, it's really nice. In fact, you could go with your wife and watch the sunrise and it'd be romantic because it's just so nice. But we know if you get up to the face of the sun, it's the most terrifying. There's nothing on earth as terrifying as the face, the face of the sun. 50,000 miles, flames leap up. The whole earth, if it dropped onto the, the sun, would be just in an instant. It's so terrifyingly hot. And God's nature is just the same. If we look at him from a distance through the eyes of unregenerate humanity, God's just nice. He's just loving and kind and sweet, like a big snuggly teddy bear. He's a divine butler. But if you get up close and look at scripture and see what it says about God, our God is a consuming fire. When he gave his law and, and, and the scriptures tell us in Genesis, I think 20, so terrible was the sight. Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. This is a friend of God. Israel said, don't let him speak, lest we die. They were terrified to death when God spoke. When he came with a smile on his face, in peace to give his law to Israel. So what we have to do is move people from idolatry to reality, to open up what scripture says about the character and nature of God and put the fear of God in them. And so they'll depart from sin. And the same has to happen with the church. Paul said, wherefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. If you don't persuade men, it's probably because you don't know the terror of the Lord. You've got that divine butler image in your mind of that old hairy man reaching out to touch Adam's finger with his finger. That's idolatry. And so I meditate 
a lot on the subject of how I think about it. I let the horror fill my heart. So it gives compassion to my tone when I share with the ungodly. What kind of reaction have you gotten? Because you've talked about this uh, in your YouTube videos, in your witnessing encounters. Uh, what kind of reactions have you gotten from people outside the church? And then what kind of reactions have you gotten from people inside the church? Outside the church, um, hell makes no sense if you don't use the law to bring the knowledge of sin. And I think that's one of the reasons people stay away from it. If you open up, if you open up uh, the divine law, magnify the law and make it honorable as the Messiah was said to do, as Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount, then judgment makes sense. If God really does see anger without cause, being in danger of judgment, lust as adultery, hatred as murder, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, suddenly sin becomes exceedingly sinful. And I like it to the thought as if you're a, a patient and you think you're incredibly well, you work out, you've got a great physique, you can run, you know, 20 miles, no problem. And I know you've got a terrible cancerous disease that's going to kill you in a couple of weeks. I'm not going to give you the cure straight away. That would be very unwise. If you think you're healthy and I say, I've got a cure to a disease, and you're just going to say, look, get it out of my face. What I would do is if I was a doctor, I'd take x-rays, I'd come around to you, and I'd let you see the x-rays so that sweat comes to your brow as you become convinced of the terrible danger that's in, that you're in. And then once I've showed you the x-rays, then I'll give you a cure and you'll appreciate it and appropriate it. And the x-rays are God's law. Humanity thinks they're morally healthy. I'm a good person. If I do sin, it's just mistakes. They're just tiny things. God wouldn't even be interested, not even slightly. And so what we've got to do is take the x-rays up close and let them sweat when they realize that God's seen their thought life and he does consider lust to be adultery and fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. And once that sweat is there and they begin to say, what shall I do? And you give them the gospel, then they'll appreciate it and they will thank you for warning them about the reality of hell. Paul reasoned with Felix of righteousness, temperance and judgment to come and Felix trembled. Why? because he suddenly understood the very character of our holy creator and it made him tremble at the thought that he was intemperate. So the reaction with non-Christians is great, probably 95% of the time. Got a proud, arrogant, self-righteous guy. He just wants to say he's healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, because he's having sex with his girlfriend and he doesn't need God's mercy and he just doesn't want to give up his sins. They're not usually offended. They just, you know, I don't want this. Uh, within the church, what I have done when I wanted to challenge people about the fact that they don't mention hell and that they're not concerned for the lost, the two are probably combined. If you don't mention hell and don't preach hell, you probably are not concerned that people are going there. I love Charles Spurgeon because I was able to grab one of his quotes many years ago and use it. And this was the quote. And I'd be preaching in a church and I'd say, Charles Spurgeon said, have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. And I was so thrilled because people could get angry at Spurgeon and not me because I was quoting him. But it's exactly what that was my conviction. If you don't have love enough to save a child from drowning or go into a home and warn them their house is on fire, where is the love of God? If there's no love, why is there, why is there an assurance of salvation when love is the key and leads up the fruit of the spirit? If there's no love, then you need to examine yourself and see if you're in the faith. So has the church just, have they lost their love or is there just a lot in the church that are not saved? And that's why they don't feel the need to share this because I, I, I mean, obviously I go to churches that would think that mentioning hell is very important, but then I read on, I read comments on your Facebook page or on your YouTube or uh, things that we post about hell and, and people like, Hey, listen, you shouldn't be so, so mean about this. You shouldn't, you know, don't, don't try to scare people, you know, don't, don't be so legalistic and so judgmental just to try to get some more page views. You know, that seems to be the, 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 the attitude that I see some that would claim to be inside the church that would claim to be Christians take as you mention the, the idea or the reality of hell. Yeah, I've got a cut and paste that I give to those folks on the comments that say, you know, Jesus wouldn't do this and he'd be more loving and don't try and scare people. And so I say, well, you better tell Jesus about your philosophy. And then there's a couple of quotes from Jesus. 
Fear not him who has power to kill your body and afterwards do no more, but fear him who has power to kill your body and cast your soul into hell. Fear him. If your hand causes you to sin, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out or cut it off or it's better to end in heaven, better to end in heaven without an eye, without a right hand than go to hell. And they are tremendously sobering words if you think about them. Think about your eye, how precious it is. If someone went to attack your eye and pull it out like an oyster, you would, with every ounce of energy you've got, defend your eye. You'd get your hands there. You'd, you'd hit them. You'd punch them to get them off because you don't want to have your eye ripped out. Well, Jesus said, if that eye causes you to sin, with the value that it has to you, put your finger in and rip it out like an oyster and toss it from you. Don't even leave it on the ground where you're going to put it back in. If it's causing you to look at pornography and commit adultery in your heart or causing you to have a wandering, wandering eye and lust after women without any restraint, without any conscience. Better for you to be blind and end up in hell with that eye. So these are very sobering words. And I take consolation when I read scripture to know that I'm on the right path. We're to warn every man, may present every man perfect because God is morally perfect. He gave a perfect law. The law of the Lord is perfect. And the only way anyone can be perfect is for them to be in Christ. He's the one that makes us pure and perfect in the sight of a holy God. Wow. Powerful truth. Uh, John says powerful and truthful. Hey, uh, do you remember the clip from 1965 where Paul? Oh, Harvey yes. He said, I, I'm going to give a warning to America, and the title of it is now called, If I Were the Devil. And he says, if I were the devil, if I were the, the prince of darkness, and he talks about, you know, kind of what he would do, and he concludes that by saying, if I were the devil, I just keep right on doing what I'm doing. Uh, Eric, I overtalked you then, and I didn't hear who said that. Can you remind me? Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey. Said that. Oh, Paul, Paul Harvey. Harvey. I'm not really familiar with him, but I think I remember hearing about that. Yes. I just, as I think through the process, I, I hear that and it's, it's all the things that, you know, we're still doing that, that are happening today. And he mentions these things. And I, I, I was thinking to myself just uh, over this last week of traveling, if I were the devil, what would I want to do? I, I would want to deceive people into thinking they are saved when they are not saved. I would want to give them the, the feeling of security without having security. Um, and I, I, I hope this doesn't sound, maybe, I don't know how you're going to take this, but I was like, you have such creative, imaginative thoughts. If you were the devil, Ray, what would you be doing to the church today? I would get rid of the fear of God. That's what I would do. That means everything breaks down. You know, I've been using an, a little uh, scenario for the last few days, creating a video, and I'm very excited about it for our YouTube channel, where I got secular guys. And I said to them this, I said, you've got two weeks to live. You're going to be dead in two weeks. And a friend in Vegas hears about this. He owns a casino and he immediately calls you and says, I want you to have pleasure for the last two weeks of your life. So I've lined up these gorgeous prostitutes for you um, and uh, just come over here. We'll fly you over totally free. And I say, so what are you going to do? Are you going to have penitent prayer because you're scared of going to hell? Or are you going to have pleasure with prostitutes? Which way will you go? And it immediately threw these guys into dilemmas. Uh, a whole stack of them go different ways. Uh, ones would say, "Oop, oh, but I have to take the hookers in uh, in uh, Vegas for sure. I'm going to I'm going to enjoy the last two weeks of my life." Others would say, "No, I'd go to prayer. I would go to prayer." And the determining factor was whether or not someone fears God. If you don't fear God, you'll give your heart to sin. Pleasure will be on your agenda rather than righteousness. Happiness is above righteousness. But if you fear God, which quite a few non-Christians told me, well, I think the whole three of them that said they would go into prayer, they weren't even Christians. But they said, oh, no, I, I, that would be wrong. I'd be terrified. I'd fall into God's hands. In a couple of weeks, I've got to face him. And uh, so it's a very good springboard, but it really shows the issue at stake it's the fear of God through the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. If there's no fear of God within the church, you'll have evil in the church, within the church. If there's no fear of God in the nation, the nation will give itself to homosexuality, adultery, blasphemy, fornication, pornography. Anything will go if there's no fear of God. And so as Christians, as uh, representatives or as ambassadors of Christ, we have to reflect the nature and character of God and preach the fear of God. And there's no better way to do that than to open up that divine law. That's what brought the fear of God 
in, in uh, on Mount Sinai, and we've got to give some thundering and lightnings from the pulpit and put the fear of God back into the church so the church becomes purified, and then it becomes like the church of the book of Acts and can reach the world. Wow, I'm curious what you guys watching are thinking when you hear this. I'm curious if you're understanding this reality of why it's so important to 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 love people by telling them about hell and by not telling them about hell you're literally loving them to hell you actually have hatred in your heart towards them because you're not doing anything about the fact that they are on their way to an eternity in hell uh ray i want to do my giveaway here of the evidence bible and again guys if you haven't gotten your copy of the evidence bible we have it at the creation today store uh creationtoday.org or ray's ministry incredible website with tons of great content livingwaters.com would encourage you to check that out that's livingwaters.com and and get a copy of his evidence bible but not only that man grab grab their tracks ray um i you, you have produced track after track after track after track helping people understand you know where they're at and and really doing it in a creative way that helps people uh see their need for the gospel can you talk a little bit about some of the, why you've kind of done what you've done with gospel tracks? Yeah, when I first looked at tracks 30 or 40 or 45, 50 years ago, and I immediately began using tracks, I thought to myself, these are incredibly boring. <laughs> they were just pamphlets, uh, usually promoting a church, and there was no, there were no graphics, no nothing, just absolute boredom. So the first tract I uh, produced back in 1972, I think it was, was a guy standing with a piece of corn that was like five feet high had his hand on the top of it they just put the corn close to the guy pretended to put his picture there and and i just said why is this guy holding on to a massive piece of corn and that was the question and i shared the gospel and um at the end i said i have no idea and that was the end of the track and i just used curiosity to pull people in and so we've used curiosity and uh just different little means like the pink and blue or not pink and blue, the curved illusion tracks, which uh, use a, an optical illusion to get people's attention. They are so amazing to actually see something that doesn't make sense with your eyes or the million dollar bill or the billion dollar bill or trillion, whatever. There we go. The, the red looks, the blue looks bigger than the, even though you've got a red, a blue shirt on. And uh, that's exactly the same color as your shirt. That's about it. Um, yeah, the one looks bigger than the other. And when you swap them over, um, they change. Yes, so there you are. I actually did that with a cookie. I bake cookies the same shape. Uh, it's a great thing to give to kids. Hold up those two cookies and say, which one do you want? And the greedy kid says, I want that big one there. So you swap them over and give them what's the little one. He's the one that he chose. But it does work with cookies also. Well, I just love it that you are consumed with how to share the gospel. And it's a it's something that I'm I wish I was better at coming up with tracks, by the way, in the next in the next half hour after I let social media go. I, I'm gonna ask you to help us out on creating some tracks, okay? Since you're you're the king of that. Uh, you've done that really well. You've got your million dollar bill, and then I, I'll never forget the first time I heard you say it. I still laugh. It's a million dollar bill, and you say, Is that not big enough? You need something bigger, and you pulled this out. I was like, oh man. I mean, to bring and can you break guys, a big bill? Yeah, you, you have changed your large bills. Yes, love that. Uh, hey, the giveaway today, I want to uh, thank our partners. By the way, guys, today's show is brought to you by our partners. If you ever want to help us reach the world with the gospel message, just go to creationtoday.org and become a partner with us. Our partners actually get to join us and interact with the guest via Zoom. So I'll be asking their questions to Ray here in just a few minutes. Uh, but our partner that's winning the Evidence Bible is Mary Hennant. Mary Hennant, we're gonna be sending you an Evidence Bible. And if we remember to tell Ray, he will sign it and give that Bible, we'll ship that Bible out to you. Thank you for doing that. And Mary, thanks for being a Creation Today partner. Really, really thankful for you. Um, and and Mary, I believe, goes out and shares the gospel. So I'm really excited about that. She she loves doing what you do and how you do it. Uh, so thank you, Mary, for joining me today. Um, Facebook and YouTube, I, I cut you guys off right here at the half hour mark. I'm sorry. If you want the full program, come on over to creationtoday.org. You can partner with us for any amount you want. And that partnership just helps us reach the world with the gospel. And through that, you get access to kind of the behind the scenes and get to ask Ray or any of my guests questions that you have. So goodbye for now. Looking forward to next week. I'm going to be going to the Wisconsin Dells and bringing you some geology from the Wisconsin Dells that is 
unbelievable evidence. I mean, we're going to put rock on rock and show you the worldwide flood absolutely happened. It's not the best evidence. It doesn't outdo what God's word gives us, but it's phenomenal on how it confirms God's word. So Operation Wisconsin Dells, if all goes well, is going to be next week. Thank you guys for joining me. We'll see you live at noon central time next week right here on social media. Hey, for my partners out there, um, I want to give you a chance to ask Ray some questions. And Ray, I've already got one uh, question for you. And, and, and I know this can go